Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Delucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Drive On Podcast. Today, my guest is Wayne Shipman. Wayne is an Army veteran who wound up living outdoors as a homeless man in uh, 2005. Uh, while he was living outdoors, he had to face the realities of his homelessness, uh, a divorce, bad parenting, uh, drug use, and his own mental health condition, uh, which led him on a path of sobriety and ultimately ended his his time living on the streets. So uh, I, I want to welcome uh, Wayne to the show. Welcome, Wayne. Uh, thanks for for joining me. Scott, it's really great to be here talking to you. I've heard a lot of your content and you got me hooked. You got me oh, hooked. Awesome. That's that's great. So um, I, I went over a little bit of, of, of your background, but could you give us a, a little you know, kind of uh, overview of, of your background, what, what led you to join the military and, and uh, kind of what, what happened uh, to you in, in, in that, in that situation when you were in the military? Yeah, that's uh, kind of a long story. It's, it's, it's something I got to shave the ice and just kind of give you the, the shavings of it because it's just, it goes sure. on and on and on. It's layers of things that kind of led up to the situations that I was in that, 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 you know, I was a homeless guy and I was on dope and given up, frankly, but, uh, hopefully what I, the message that I'm trying to bring, I'm trying to give you the end game. So you don't have to spend 15 minutes figuring out why I'm telling you this story is uh, after all of my disappointments and things that I experienced after the military, trying to adjust to civilian life, I pretty much encountered shame and um, a lot of disgrace that I carried with me because I didn't make it in the military. I failed. I ended up getting kicked out about six months early from my end of service. And that hurt me over the years. And so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to kind of reach out to soldiers, former military that's had similar experiences. And, you know, I went into the military looking for kind of my golden ticket to be respected by my family and members, you know, my family members growing up, man, as a post-World War II era, a lot of my grandma, my uncles, you know, they had pictures on their walls of military people. And some of them were from the Vietnam era. And I was the first grandson out of six daughters in the family. And so all eyes were on me, you know, and through the years, I heard it all. I mean, every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, when people would get together, there was Wayne playing with his little Tonka toys, but they were all talking about, you know, Wayne's going to do great. He's going to be this. He's going to be that. And I kept hearing from more and more and more often, he's going to make a great military man. He's going to be a great soldier. Well, that's because grandpa was, and so was Uncle Tom, and so was somebody else, and somebody else. And it got to me, you know, to where... I expected to join the military, but I resisted it right up to the last minute. I had military parents and we moved around a lot. You know, the whole routine every two, three years, we were gone somewhere. And over the years, I developed some real, um, some real disorders in adjusting to civilian life after the military, because I went into the military with certain expectations and I went into the military expecting to be turned into a real soldier. And I'm not talking about, you know, going in blazing guns. I didn't, I really didn't care if I saw combat. I was kind of scared of that aspect. I was willing, but really I just, when I joined the military, I, I chose parachute rigor because of course, like most, you know, most wise recruiters, they give you two really lame things to choose from and one that they're trying to push you to. Well, I chose parachute rigor, which was way out of character for me at the time. I grew up smoking pot. I had long hair all the way through high school. I was disobedient. <laughs> I, was, I was rebellious. I was stubborn and hard-headed. And when I joined the military, 
it was like voted least likely to succeed because of that, you know, but I actually expected the shift to happen for me because I was expecting to be a military soldier and do military things. Like I said, I wasn't looking to go to combat. That isn't what I was after. But up until that time, I really didn't have any reason to think that I was going to live a life as an adult of being successful. You know, the typical thing about chasing the American dream and working for corporations and stuff. Heck, I couldn't get along with my English teacher in 11th grade, crying out loud. I wasn't going to make it on a job. But I was sorely disappointed, man, when I when I joined the military. Um, I like I said, uh, this recruiter had promised me, he said, you know, being a parachute rigger, this was in 1987, 1987. And he said, there's 99 percent chance I'm going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I would be doing real military deployment stuff, not necessarily combat related, but I would be all the time doing training exercises and airdrop ex, you know exercises dropping ammunition and supplies even if it's just in training i would be very busy doing my job as a parachute rigger and of course supporting some of the military jumps you know the airborne operations down there i was all on board for that and lo and behold they sent me to fort richardson alaska into a garrison unit and i wasn't actually in a real company i was an attachment I was, there was 14 of us parachute riggers in an attachment of like 250 soldiers in Alpha Company Garrison. And we had soldiers from, we, some of them were mechanics, some of them were cooks, some of them worked at the, you know, the <laughs> troop medical clinic. Some of them, I'm not even sure what they were doing, but they weren't, we weren't doing real soldier stuff. They weren't jumping out of airplanes. That, that, well, I think that's, we that's were, the key. But they I mean, some of them. Yeah. yeah, they weren't. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it wasn't like you were in uh, Fort Bragg where where nope. they they were they, going to be doing that with the majority yeah. of the people you were stationed with, uh, yeah. or who were stationed there, I should say. Um, uh, where that that was basically their job, and and that you know you'd be you'd be doing all that stuff you know on a on a routine basis. But um, it sounds like what you're looking for was the, uh, the structure and the discipline and, yeah. the, um, you know, the, the, yeah. the rigor of, of military life. And what you got was thrown into a garrison unit and it was, uh, anything but that it, it seems like. Right. And so, um, you know, coming from, uh, you know, a, a life where you, you were looking for that type of, um, that type of structure and then then you don't get it uh, then it's like oh oh crap now where if i can't get it in the military where the heck am i going to get that from right <laughs> you know so yeah um, so I, I can imagine when you when you get out um that it's it's a pretty scary world to get out into um when when you're uh you're you're smack with that reality of civilian life and um you know how you were no longer uh you know getting the the training that you were, you were expecting to be getting. Um, so how long was it, uh, before, or so after getting out of the military, how long was it before you, you found yourself, uh, you know, living out on the streets and, and, uh, without a home? It was many years, actually. Um, I got out officially October of 1990 and it was, I think 2005 when I actually resorted to living on the streets okay. and uh, you know, there was a lot that led up to that, but the link, there was a link, you know, once you're homeless, Scott, you're, you're, you're around other homeless people and it's no longer a mysterious, they're no longer so mysterious. The mysterious, you know, the, the mystery about homeless people is kind of why I started hanging around with them in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up in Portland, Oregon, in in some traveling and when i stepped off the greyhound bus there i was just in love with the city the the architecture the statues the fountains the people and one of, i think the very first day i was there some guy walked by with a backpack and on the backpack it was like a bumper stick bumper sticker that said keep portland weird you know <laughs> i'm not kidding man and yeah. I, you know i heard drums and i was like what is this major drum thing going on it was something like September 
of 2002 when I arrived in Portland and I heard these drums, these major, it sounded like tribal drums, like the Apaches were just over the hill you know, banging on their drums. Well, I started following the sound of the drums and it was like this, it was like 40 hippies out there. Like a bunch of them were white guy with dreads, you know, and they were beating on these drums and it was kind of an annual celebration to, um, it was the fall harvest kind of thing. And in Portland, they have the Rose Festival Parade and they have all kinds of stuff that happen in the September. Well, it was just really an excuse for these guys to be out there partying is what it was. Right. And when I walked out there and saw that, and then I kind of went around the corner and I started seeing, I was on Skid Row and I didn't know it. The bus let me out like three or four blocks away from the actual, uh, the, the road where you, most of the homeless missions are on Burnside Road, Burnside Boulevard. I, there's like 15 different homeless missions down there. And there was all these homeless people standing in line. And so when I got off the bus, I was just kind of like, kicking back leaning against a tree looking at them i was going well sorry for you guys you know what what's your problem why don't you just snap out of it why right. what is this are you just you just love welfare you know <laughs> you just your mommy didn't give you a you know a good enough education or whatever i mean i was pretty sarcastic but not to them but privately i had the same kind of judgment call that most of us have when we see homeless people but for the first time i saw literally thousands of homeless people. The more that I hung around downtown Portland, Portland has 2 million people in the metropolitan area. So the more that I hung around in the actual downtown area, the more I saw just homeless people was common. And so later on in 2004, about two years later, I was having some really tough psychological adjustment issues. And it wasn't related to the military, not directly. But I do have a message, and I call it the backside of PTSD. Um, I have other podcast. I'm not a podcast host, but right now I really I'm I'm getting invited to other people, and I'm a guest speaker on several podcasts. And so what I'm doing is I've been trying to convey the message of homelessness to the average citizens, the average people out there, because especially during COVID, man, COVID changed. COVID changed everything. COVID changed the game, especially for the homeless. And so at heart, I'm a homeless advocate. Uh, obviously, I'm not homeless anymore. But I went through this period of very severe psych psychological disorders, um, including I was diagnosed by a psychiatrist and a doctor doing, they did blood met metabiolic, they did the full physical on me extensive psychological evaluations over a period of like six months. And in the end, it was more like layers of several different personality and mood disorders that were kind of retroactive or triggering each other, which I didn't know. All I knew was I was angry. I was mad at the world. I was feeling like I didn't belong. I didn't fit in. No matter what job I took, whether it was a warehouse, maintenance technician for apartments, driving city cab, you know, now I've been a semi truck driver for five years and I'm really having a hard time with that. And it, that's because there's too many people out there that have road rage issues, you know? Yeah. Man, I'm not joking. You know what I mean, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You get on the highway and it's a game of life and death. And all you're doing is really just going to get a gallon of milk or something, man. Right. You go somewhere and people have no regard now for human life, not even their own. And I'm in a semi truck. And so this struggle has been with me for many years. And I didn't understand what it was being triggered into bipolar anger, being triggered into some of the really more serious traits of borderline personality disorder. And I mean, you know, it gets intense. And so I've had to really learn skills that aren't taught in school. I had to learn skills post-military because the military wasn't willing to offer me any kind of skill training to deal with my psychology, my anger problems, my depression at the time. They, unfortunately, I was in a unit that did not really want to take time to help soldiers through counseling services. They didn't get into that. 
this was, you were in the military, you knew what you were getting into when you signed up, which I don't really believe we do, you know, essentially. Most of us, 19 years old, coming out of high school, coming from the busted, broken home that I came from, I certainly didn't know what I was getting into. I just knew that I was willing. And so later on, when I was having a really hard time in 2004, I realized once and for all, I'm, I'm homeless. And I didn't just, you know, it wasn't just because I lost a job or whatever. It's because I became the epitome of a real homeless person that could not actually sustain myself by working for a living. I couldn't, I would get a job, lose it, get a job, lose it. I would either get offended by somebody and just walk out, or I would just get mad and just go off the hook throwing things. And people were frightened. I mean, I punched the time clock off the wall one day because some guy said, well, you need, you can't be in here taking your 15 minute break if you didn't clock out. And somebody told me that I could. I walked over there and I punched it. I didn't punch out with the time clock. I punched the clock off the wall. And everybody in the break room just looked at me like, what was that? <laughs> and I'm yeah. just looking at them like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know. And so what I found out was that was common for someone with bipolar and especially having a combination of different things going on. And I know a lot of former military suffer from this PTSD. There's 10,000, you know, people on YouTube and everything else talking about PTSD. But my, my first big message is, you know, things like PTSD and bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder, whatever you want to call them, it may explain the symptoms that you're witnessing or they, they demonstrate, but it certainly does not describe the experience we're having. If you say, well, he's got PTSD, then if you line up five people in a room and you say, what do you think is PTSD? All of them have a different kind of an explanation of the yep. symptoms and things. My PTSD that I'm talking about is not battle related. It's post-traumatic stress disorder that came from myself coming from a busted family, a busted home, pretty messed up childhood, getting into adult life with some unreasonable expectations of what I thought the military was and some unexpected, you know, unreasonable expectations of what I was going to become as a military soldier because it didn't work. When that didn't happen, the amount of patriotism and the amount of enthusiasm that I had invested in being this soldier kind of backfired. And that's the amount of disgrace that I felt. That's the amount of shame that I felt. That's the amount of disappointment that I walked around with. Yeah. And, and we were talking uh, earlier uh, before we started recording here and and you had mentioned how uh, when you became homeless and you were hanging around more and more with the people who were homeless, that you were starting to relate more with them than you were with, you know, everybody else in society. Right. And, and so, um, you know, when you, when you start to relate with people, you kind of want to maybe hang out with them more than uh, other people. Right. And so, um, you know, do you think that that contributed to the fact that you, you remained homeless for, uh, an extended period of time or, or was, was there, was there ever a time when, when, uh, you know, early on when you first found yourself being homeless, um, that you were, you're trying to figure that out? Or did you just say, you know what, th- these are my people and I'm, I'm going to hang out here. Or, you know, what, what was that situation like? Well, I, I think the way that I could explain it is I came to a realization as a homeless person. I was out there for probably a year at the time. And I mean, in the wintertime, don't get me wrong. There's, there was at the time plenty of indoor shelters that kept us indoors at night. But at 6, 30, 7 o'clock in the morning, you were out. And yeah. I mean, there was days when it was minus five degrees with 10 degree knot, you know, 10 knot winds, nowhere to go, nothing to do. And they kicked us out of the mission. So we're walking around in the snow in the dark in December, nothing to do. But what I realized was I found not really a sense of belonging as a homeless person, but I found a sense of um, how much I related with them in the reasons why they were homeless. 
got it. I found a, I found, I had the word a minute ago, but I, I kind of tripped myself up. Normalcy. I started experiencing normalcy in a different way when I was around these other homeless people. And what I mean by that is, um, I, you know, maybe you can put my YouTube link in, in this show notes and, um, the YouTube channel that I have, I am not a YouTuber. I'm not doing weekly videos and I'm not trying to gather a following and all that stuff. And I'm not self-promoting, but I have a YouTube channel just so that any of my podcast recordings that I'm doing right now is on there. So there's kind of an, 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 an arrangement of, there's a, there's a variety of different topics that I talk about. Every single podcast that I'm doing, I can relate with homelessness. I was real deal homeless. I was living with them, camping with them, eating with them. And pretty soon I realized, God, I was one of them, man. I wasn't just experiencing homelessness. I was a homeless person. And, you know, I can point to my temple and say, I became homeless right here. And what that means is I realized I was a misfit in society and I didn't know why. I mean, that's the frustration. I was willing to be to work on time. I was willing to shave my face if they wanted me to. I was willing to wear their dorky looking hats with the company emblems on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever they told me to do, I'm a company man. I'm here. I'm going to do this. But where I did not fit in was the company politics. Uh, the side, the side jokes going on, you know, a little bit, you know, making fun of each other. Now that's, Usually it's okay when we when we get together and we're we're buddies enough that we can make fun of each other and stuff. But on the job it can get awkward, and sure. I wasn't handling it well because I was mentally unstable. And it went beyond that to where, whenever we would sit in a break room, for instance, I always had a hard time with small talk. The you know talking about well I went fishing this last weekend and well I got me a you know I got me a pair of skis and I'm going to go up to the lodge and go skiing and you know I got me a mountain bike and they would tell you the gear ratio and the tire size and all this stuff and I'm like I'm just sipping on my Coca Cola and I don't have none of that to talk about I don't have nothing interesting to say and it's a it, it's also a shaming element because no matter what environment I'm in back then no matter what environment I was in. I did not experience normalcy the way they did. I was always the odd guy. I was always the quiet one sitting off on the side, wanting to be left alone. I just wanted to show up, clock in, do my job, take lunch, come back, do my job, go home. To them, if you're not really interesting and engaging, you're weird, you know. And no matter what job I went on, I, I, I kind of experienced the same stuff. And when I went into the military, I had the same problem, okay? But as a 19-year-old young man, just fresh out of high school, literally, and, and joined the Army, I thought the Army was the only backstory I needed. I thought being a parachute rigger and doing interesting things, jumping out of C-130s and stuff was enough to talk about. And But then, here's the challenge I got into. I was around real military people. And I was around people that were stable mentally and emotionally. And I was around people that was confident in their skills. They were confident, not only if they were a parachute rigger or an infantry soldier, they were confident people. When you'd see them on the weekend, they were wearing blue jeans and a ball cap. You know, when you see them Monday morning, they're wearing BDU pants and jungle boots. And, you know, they weren't carrying a dummy M16, it was for real. But right. these people had real stories. They had really interesting lives. And what I had was unreasonable expectations, like I said. And unreasonable, except, you know, this that I'm talking about is really linked to some of the disorders that I mentioned. It's called grandiose ideas. Okay. It's called grandiose expectations. The guy that's bipolar or the guy that's very much insecure about my, you know, like I was very insecure about my upbringing and who I was as a person. I had a very unstable identity as a person, as a young man. And so when I was around other people, I was hearing their stories and I knew there was no BS here at this table. And the only thing I had to bring was BS stories. 
because I didn't really have anything I was proud of to talk about. And so when I could not cut it in my military unit, and you know, the, I'm just going to give you the 60 second rundown on this, but the world's worst thing happened to me was I met a girl kind of when I first got there within the first few weeks of being there, she got pregnant within the first couple of weekends of hanging out together. And the story was she was just as mentally unstable as I was. And in her own way, she had angry meltdowns. She had out of control, just belligerent, mad temper tantrums. And I'm, I kind of grew up with that. My, you know, I witnessed that in my home growing up. And so it was just so much more of the same. And I had to get away from this lady because she was triggering me in a way that no one had triggered me before. I didn't realize that I had these disorders, but they were more like dormant. They were in their infancy stages back then. When I became 34, 35 years old, 2004, 2005, these disorders were very real and I could not function normally with normalcy among regular people because they would trigger me in certain ways and I didn't understand it. My triggers would happen. And they just said, look, dude, you need to get a hold of yourself. You need to get a grip. Well, I kept hearing that in the military. You need to suck it up. You need to march on. You, we, ain't, we don't have time to hear nothing about your dang pregnant girlfriend stuff. All these soldiers out here is having pregnant girlfriends. I said, yeah, but mine's throwing dishes at the wall. You know, mine is like really crazy lady. And I was actually asking for a transfer, I think for, I think for probably nine or 11 months, I kept sending letters up through JAG and through the military, the right channels. I was trying to get sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That's what they promised me. You know, I was wanting to be a real, in a real 82nd Airborne operation, 82nd Airborne, you know, have that on my shoulder. Man, I was in a unit where we were singing the same, like, lame three or four cadence songs every morning every you know we did a two mile run three times a week and every time we do the two mile run it was the exact same three or four cadences c-130 running down the strip you know what i mean yeah, oh yeah come on man and and i was the guy in the unit i was the guy going new cadence new cadence and, and they were getting tired of hearing me talk about it but I just was out of place in the military. And then later in life as a civilian, I just realized I have real disorders. Sure. And, uh, and when I was homeless, I was talking to you before we started recording. Not only did I find I was, I related with most homeless people because we were no longer mechanic, maintenance technician, semi-truck driver. We were just human beings. We were Americans, right? Yeah. And we were also displaced Americans. Actually, we were called um, loitering. <laughs> it was uh, a lot of really stereotypical things. Labels were put on us because we didn't have anywhere to go. So we were always loitering somewhere. We were always trespassing somewhere. We were always harassed by either security guards, police officers, or just somebody walking by, somebody taking pictures with their cell phones. Look at, look at these homeless people. And we're just sitting there going, I, I don't want my picture taken. Right. And so, Scott, I started encountering on a regular basis, former military, probably my age. I'm saying at the time I was 37 years old, I was encountering former military people that were just recently getting out up to maybe 50 years old. And so many of them, there's a thread of commonality that all of us had. And it was, we couldn't adjust. We didn't know kind of where we belong. And the problem was in the years back then, when I was in the military, there was not as much buzz talk about support. There was not as much, uh, there was not as much encouragement about soldier counseling services available to members of the armed forces. There was not much of that at all. In fact, it was actually shunned. It was kind of like, well, Jesus, why are you here? You know, so what? You got to grow pregnant. You know, can't you just suck it up? Right. They didn't understand the gunfire going off in my mind. You know, I was at work packing, packing parachutes, but I couldn't get this out of my head and I couldn't focus on what I was doing. And it was just making me frustrated and mad. 
Well, they saw it as, you know, I was not fit for military service because I was mentally unstable. That's what they started writing down in their psychological evaluations. Right. And the easiest thing in the world would have been introduce me to somebody that can help me understand how to cope with my challenges. Nowadays, I'm hearing, especially on your channel, man, you got me hooked. I mean, I'm still trying to, there's some of them I'm going, I'm back treading, trying to listen to them a second and third time. There's a lot of services now where they realize and they recognize just because a soldier has angry fits or just because he's depressed all the time doesn't mean he's not fit for military service. It just means he needs help. He needs support. He, she, I mean, yep. one of your, one of your podcasts that really got me stirring. I, I don't remember the lady's name, but it's, it's called the enemy within mm -hmm. or dealing yeah, with the enemy within. Yeah. It's uh, Brandy Benson. Yeah. Brandy. Yeah. Man. I get speechless trying to kind of just revisit her experience. I hope people will actually listen to that podcast because I can't do it justice telling her story right now, but she experienced the epitome of trying to deal with something traumatic with no support, right? No support from military command, no support from your comrades. Okay. But her mother was the one visiting the hospital. Her mother was staying with her side by side. And her mother was the one keeping her spirit, at least with an element of hope. So she got cancer in her leg, which sounds like whatever, you got cancer in your leg. This cancer was killing her. She was one of the top notch soldiers. She did not have a chip on her shoulder trying to prove that, you know, females can do what men can do. That's not what she was doing. She was just being a soldier. That's what I loved about her story. She was not, she was not a pitiful story of, you know, I'm a female, treat me right. She was a soldier and she got cancer and it happened to be in her leg. Well, when they, when they had to amputate her leg later on, she started realizing that there's an enemy within because what she said was she was so health fitness and so oriented to pushing herself beyond expectations you know she was always trying to max out the pt test and everything else well now she can't run she can't do the things and there was a lot of things that she couldn't do because of her limitation but as the illness came on she was treated by the military doctors as this is terminal this is terminal you don't really have any hope and so you're in this ward with all these other soldiers and they're terminal too so we have other soldiers we have other patients and pretty much we're going to try to keep you comfortable, but we have other work to do. That was the atmosphere. And unfortunately, I'm here, you know, I've heard a lot from people that experienced it through the VA hospitals, but I'm also hearing many stories where the VA hospitals where that was, you know, if it weren't for the treatment they got in the VA hospitals, they would have gave up hope anyway. But they were treated as comrades, they were treated as members of a, of a military force. And they were given the respect they deserve, but there's stories where they weren't. And she said, well, you're telling me I'm a statistic and statistically this is fatal. And statistically, she said, what if I'm the exception? And she started actually believing in herself as though she could be this exception. And she actually overcame it and she got out. And I think the, the story was everyone that she was, um, in company with in this in the cancer ward she was the only one that actually made it out alive and the, the the deciding factor was she had an attitude of hope she had an attitude of positive expectation and she had support her mother was actually the one encouraging her and reading books to her and just kind of treating her as if there is hope right yeah and you know honestly that's that's the message that i like to get across with this podcast is that there is hope for people who are out there who are struggling with with any number of things whether it's uh homelessness like in your case or uh uh substance abuse or uh you know diseases or other you know you name it that whatever you may be going through there there's hope for you um even even if you feel like all hope is lost even if all the the quote-unquote experts are telling you uh 
you know, give up hope because this is, this is terminal. You're, it, you know, you only have a X number of months or years or whatever to live. Well, what if they're wrong? You know, it's, it's not the first time that, that one of these people have been wrong before. Right. So what if they are wrong or what if you are that, you know, even if it's 99 out of a hundred chances that, that, uh, you know, what if you're that one that, that is going to make it through? Um, so, so definitely, you know, it, it definitely we're trying to give, uh, you know, some hope, uh, to, to people here. And, I'd like to, you, you started uh, mentioning a little bit about, you know, how people cope with, with various things. And I'd, I'd like to ask you if you're, you're okay with it, uh, to talk about how you're coping with some of these, these disorders now, if there's any medications or therapies or, or things like that, that you've, you've gone through that you'd like to, to mention. I've been on a very long, lonely walk through some very, very dark places that was not combat related in the military. But one thing that that soldier was talking about in her podcast was the enemy within. Mm -hmm. It's the voice. It's the voice that we hear in our head that either makes it possible or makes it impossible. Am I, am I on the right trail here? Yeah. Yeah. It's the voice in our head that makes it possible or impossible. I was surrounded by people that was sick and tired of hearing my foul mouth at work and at home. I was surrounded by people that was pretty much sick and tired of my phone calls in the middle of the night saying, you know, I need 20 bucks and, and, you know, I got this going on. I got the, I always had a hustle. I always had a hustle because I couldn't make it. I couldn't, I couldn't, I could not provide for myself by working for a living in an honorable way. And usually when I was calling up to borrow 20 bucks, I was headed off to buy a bag of weed. To be honest, I, for 30 years of my life, Tom, I, I, Scott, Scott, for 30 years of my life, I stayed in a cloud of weed pot. Thankfully for me, I got off that stuff in 2011. The last time it touched my lips, I haven't had a vape. I haven't tried any of the new stuff. And I'm so glad because the new cannabis that's out there, is so powerful and potent. It's, it's robbing people's minds and they have no idea. But so when I was going through all these psychological evaluations and I was talking to the same psychiatrist repeatedly, what he was trying to get to was, is there other, is there other issues here that, that's kind of being camouflaged by the surface symptoms of what we're experiencing? Depression, angry, that stuff, usually we get diagnosed by the surface symptoms that they start experiencing. They, they witness what we're doing and they come to a conclusion and then they write it in your medical file and then they just go with it. Usually they're non-conclusive. They're not accurate. And so what I first started doing was I, I resented the fact that the only real treatment options they were offering me was a list of medications. They wanted to medicate, which was, you know, that's standard protocol. That's called standard of care, standard of care. And it, it goes, it also means you can't afford, you know, $150 an hour for real psychological counseling. <laughs> Your health insurance doesn't cover it and you can't afford it. That's what that means. So here's some medications. You need to tone it down. And so I really didn't sit well with that answer. Because at the time that this was happening to me, I was sick and tired of my own, my own pattern of misconduct. Um, sure. That got stuck in my mind because in the military, every time they wrote me up with an Article 15, it was called a pattern of misconduct. It was called misconduct slash pattern of misconduct. And I resented that. It was like, well, it's not misconduct. I'm just verbalizing my, my, my opinion when you're telling me to stand at attention, but you won't let me speak, you know. So what I ended up doing was I went all in on wanting answers. I wanted real answers. I wanted real-time explanations about why my triggers are happening. I wanted somebody to tell me the real, the real path to mental wellness other than just medications and other than, well, you have PTSD and you have bipolar disorder. So that explains it. Okay. That explains it, but that's not good enough. I want to know how 
I am supposed to manage myself because I've heard so many stories of people that came from far worse than me. And they have amazing lives. They've, 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 they're remarried. They have businesses. They have children. And they're doing it. Why not me? And when I had that attitude, I went all in on discovering the path for myself. And so what I try to keep telling everybody is you have to find your own way. It's a very dark, very lonely path. But, you know, like what worked for Tony Robbins or what worked for Wayne Dyer? Some of those things, you can find little nuggets of advice, but you can't just say, here's a six-step process to mental wellness. And if you take a few deep breaths and go by these six steps, you will have mental wellness. You start experimenting. And actually, one of your podcasts is a soldier that I don't remember his name. Um, he got out of the military and he was also that way. He couldn't find normalcy and, and everything that he was trying was not fulfilling. And he always wanted to start painting. You know, he didn't really know what his edge was, but he just started. He said, you know what? Nothing else is working for me. I'm just going to screw off for a little while. He went to Walmart or something and spent like 40 bucks, right? On some pastel paints and colors and, a, and, a, and some board. He went home. He started painting and something in him lit up. And he just found himself by expressing his portraits. He was painting military stuff. And he was like, I remember in the pot in the podcast, he said, you know, somebody came over and said, man, this is really good stuff. You need to go down here and put it on the, you know, go down here to this flea market and start advertising your stuff and let people buy it. He was like, man, people don't even know what these things are. You know, this, this heavy equipment, this, this rifle, they can't even tell me what it is. Well, when he went down there, it started selling right off the shelf and he couldn't even keep up with the demand. But he says, you have to try something. You have to begin by trying things. You can't just stay shut down and stay at home and keep the TV on and keep the curtains closed. You actually have to get out there and start, you know, experimenting with things. And what I found was writing and storytelling because I had this compassion for homeless people, which I didn't understand at the time. And I had this very serious psychological disorder that I carried around with me. And when I actually started writing and journaling, I wasn't trying to write a book, which I am now. I wasn't trying to impress people by telling them stories. I was actually just trying to write down because it was so confusing to just think out loud. I couldn't actually process what I was thinking and feeling. It was so confusing. When I started journaling and writing, I've heard several, I've, there was one other soldier that was talking about, she ended up writing and now she's published like eight books. I forgot. Oh, I wish I could remember the podcast. I was just listening to it this morning. It's one of your guests. She was talking about it. She recently retired and she was talking about most people, most people talk about the, the, the negative aspects of the VA, but the first thing you encounter is the veterans benefits department. And through the veterans benefits department, they start coaching you in how to write a resume and how to actually assemble your civilian clothing so that you can go show up on jobs, interviews and stuff. So she's writing books, man. She yeah. started out journaling because she was trying to understand her own mess. And she, she actually came up with her own way of processing and her own way of adjustment. And later on, her journals and her recordings that she was doing she had to use that material to write it into a book. And now she specializes in former military trying to make the adjustment in the civilian world. Right. She didn't know that until she started experimenting with it. Right. Exactly. And, and that, I think that's, that's one of those things where, um, and, and I've talked to other people too, where they just, they say, just try something. And, and if that thing isn't the thing for you, Try something Try else. Something it's, else. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, you know, I, I did the same thing with myself with, with uh, painting and writing and, and things like that. Um, you know, I, I hadn't picked up a paintbrush since I was a kid in, you know, elementary school or whatever. And uh, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to give it a try. And worst case scenario, 
it turns out like crap and I throw it away and, and then I don't do it anymore and I move on to something else. But best case scenario is I find out that I actually enjoy it and, and it brings me a little bit of, of peace and, and everything. So that's what I did. And I just tried something. Um, I didn't take any formal classes or, or, you know, get the fanciest uh, paints or paint brushes or all that kind of stuff. It's just something I just picked up and started doing. Um, you know, and I, I think that that's the same thing for, for anybody is, is really just try something. Um, and well, the and next keep level, trying it. The, the next level to that Scott is that's the beginning. Yeah. Okay. We get locked down thinking there's nothing else. There's nothing else for me. I've, you know, I'm a, right. I'm an infantry soldier. I, I, uh, I'm a parachute rigger. I'm out here in the civilian world. What the heck am I going to do? These people don't understand me. They don't relate with me. You know, the shrinks can't tell me what's wrong with me. We get stuck in that and that becomes our story. Right. Our story resonates day and night. We live with our own voices in our mind. And what I'm saying is I found the path to telling myself what I choose to believe. I found the path to telling myself what I'm going to refuse to live by. I'm not going to live by the symptoms of bipolar disorder, and I'm not going to live by, you know, the terrible things I experienced as a teenager growing up, you know, and I'm not going to live by this disorder label as if this is the end. So skip forward to answer your question a little better. For me personally, I've realized every person has to find their own way. What works for me, it, it worked for me, but it might not work for somebody else. But if they try what worked for me and it didn't work, that's not the end. If you if that's the end for you, you're not really trying. I got three adult children right now. They were teenagers when I was homeless and it was ripping their heart out. Man, they would, I would call them on the phone. They didn't know how to talk to some homeless guy on the phone you know, near Father's yeah. Day, they're supposed to wish me happy Father's Day. And it's, I'm homeless. The only thing they knew about homelessness is what they saw on TV, you know, or in a movie. Sure. And you, any podcast you hear of mine, I talk about this issue. This complicated my psycho, my, my mental instability, the, the element of shame and guilt. When those things take over, positive thinking is not possible looking forward to the future and trying to make plans and trying to adjust and all that stuff, you're talking gibberish because when you're stuck in a story of I'm ashamed, I'm a disgrace to my country. I don't belong here. I don't fit in. What it led to Scott was at my homeless camp out in the woods in 2005, I actually had a rope up in a tree and you'll hear my other, you know, when you hear my other content, this was real for me. But I didn't put the rope up there to end my life. I was actually living on a hillside out in the woods, and there was a lot of rats and raccoons that would come up and take my food scraps. Dude, I would hike off to town and come back, and my, my plastic containers would be chewed into. They were getting into my food. So I, I threw this rope up over this limb, and I hang my backpack up there at night, and that's where I kept my food. One morning I was boiling water for coffee and I saw this rope up there with nothing on it. And it was just kind of swaying in the breeze. I, I had already been thinking about it and I had already been entertaining the idea. Like what is suicide and what, you know, what does it matter anyway? A part of my recovery began with my rock bottom. Okay. Most of us do not want to experience what we're actually feeling and thinking when we're at rock bottom. Right. And we will do anything to numb the mind or quiet the voices. Right. And that's where a lot of the drug addictions and opioid addictions, addictions to the painkillers, all that stuff starts because we don't want to deal with them voices anymore and they won't stop. They don't stop. What I started realizing was I had to make a choice. I'm either going to go all in and find a way to be the respectable person that I want to be among everyone else. I want to find a way to fit in or, you know, stop lying to myself, man, put the, put the noose on and do it. One morning I had to make a decision and I chose not to, I cut the rope down. I actually shredded it into tiny little pieces. I cut it into like four inch pieces. 
I just sat there for like an hour cutting that rope into little bitty pieces. And it was sort of a ritual for me that I'm not coming here again. I don't care what dark path I end up on. I don't care what terrible things happen in my life. I'm not done. My story's not done. My children are going to find out about me out here. And I knew they would be having children eventually. So now fast forward, I've got six grandchildren in the families. Dude, if I would have done that, the last thing they would know is their grandpa was a homeless guy that killed himself out in the woods. End of my story. And as far as I was concerned, and I hope your audience can hear this, I deserved better than that because my intentions, it, it wasn't, I didn't do anything to deserve military honors, but by God, I really didn't get, I didn't deserve to be treated like an, like an, you know, a disgrace to my country over my girlfriend. You know what I mean? So I chose to find a path, real answers. I wanted somebody to give me the bullet point way. Like, what do I got to do? And you know what they were telling me? They were telling me the same damn thing my family and friends have been telling me for years, man. You got to take responsibility, even if it wasn't your fault. Even if your ex-wife took advantage of you and took the house and ran off with your best buddy, Mm -hmm. you got to take responsibility and move on. If you choose not to move on, you stay there. You sit there. That's your little foxhole with your little torment. And that's the voices in your head that you live with. If you choose to stay there, they won. And that's what really started, to be honest with you, if you want to bleep this out, but it pissed me off that my mother and my stepdad and the five marriages I witnessed growing up as a teenager and all the stuff defeated me. I got angry because I deserved to be recognized for my intention. I wanted to be a respectable person. And so what I did, I just started going to the bookstores. I started, you know, I started picking up audio tapes and listening to them, even though to me at that time, it sounded sissy. It's a sissy thing to do to go pick up, you know, Wayne Dyer, how to be, you know, experience self-love now, six steps to emotional happiness. Well, you need to start listening, right? And it goes back to like, if you don't want to paint, if you don't want to build engines on a car, then go listen to some stuff and start trying to find a better voice to live with. I I like that. But there's, there's 10,000 voices out there telling us we deserve to live a life of meaning and purpose. And when you decide once and for all, if I was willing at 19 years old to run off into the battlefield, if that's what they told me, it's because it was an honorable thing and I believed in it. I was patriotic, cut me anywhere. I was red, white, and blue. Well, when I was sitting out in the homeless camp in the woods, smoking pot and thinking about hanging myself with a rope just because I felt disgraced, it's the voices I had in my head. Yeah. And so I turned it around and I'm, I'm walking straight front like we did in the military. We walk towards the threat. We don't cower down. We might hide under cover, but we're waiting for the moment, right? We're waiting for the moment to have the advantage to move forward and stop the threat. Sure. If the voices in your head are telling you you're worthless, you're a disgrace, and you choose not to fight back, then it's kind of like you're bad. You're not taking responsibility for it. That's where I'm at. Well, and I, I think that's a, a great message. And uh, I, I think if anyone takes anything away from this, I, I hope that they, they know that they can keep going, they can keep trying, um, and, and not to, to give in to those voices in their head. And I, I think that's, that's a great place to, uh, to wrap, it up. Wrap, wrap this one up, you know, um, I, I think that that's a, a great message to have. So Wayne, uh, thank you again for, for coming on the show, taking the time to to share your story and, and your willingness to be open and, and vulnerable about your story. Um, it really has been a pleasure uh, hearing from you and and hearing your story. And I, I know that this, this story is going to uh, impact some people uh, who, who get, who are fortunate enough to listen to it. So, so thank you. And they need to know that it's okay. If it didn't work out, yeah. even if, you know what, I got a buddy right now. I'm telling you this as a parting message. He's 60 years old right now. The military can't use him anymore, but he's as authentic as they come. But he has a golden heart, man. He has a golden heart. And he kept telling me when we first met, he's all used up. 
he's all used up. There ain't nothing out here because he's all used up. Well, that's because he can't go on missions anymore and he can't fit into the civilian world. But I've convinced him through friendship to accept the fact that it's okay. It's okay. It's okay that America is not the John Wayne America that we saw, you know, in the Western movies. It's okay that our politicians say what they say, they get in the office, and then they do what they do. I'm just one person. I'm one man out here, and I'm not with my team anymore. I'm not in anybody's platoon anymore, and I don't answer to a chain of command. But when I lay down at night, I'm experiencing genuine self-love and acceptance because I've decided to. That's all. It's okay. Whatever happened back there, it's okay. I can accept it. But now my children are coming around and this podcast stuff, man, if you can find other former military that have similar stories like mine, it's a way to really get it out of your system. But I'm kind of forced to censor myself. I can't just get on here and F-bomb and be angry. You know, I had to get all that out of my system. Now, hopefully I have something that people can actually listen to and, and, and carry away with it. It's okay if it didn't work out. That's my message. Yeah, and I think I think for sure people are going to take something away from this this story and and your message. Um, I, I I think it really is a inspiring message where you're able to uh, you know pick yourself up and and dust yourself off and and find your own path uh, to to healing and and getting in that better place. And so um, with that, again. Uh, Thank you for for coming on and and joining me. I I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, driveonpodcast.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Drive On Podcast.